So welcome to everyone for a Sala Puja. And I think the first thing we should do is uh, offer the precepts, the three refuges and the five precepts. And, and we'll all chant the request together now. Samadhi Ami. Usawada 
Suramarayama japamadatana veratmani sikapadang samadhyami Suramarayama japamadatana veratmani sikapadang samadhyami I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drinks and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sikapadani silena suga tingyanti, silena boka sankata, silena nibu tingyanti tasma silang visodai. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Beautiful. And if tears come to your eyes once in a while when you take the refuges and precepts, that's a beautiful thing. Because <laughs> it's such a precious, wonderful thing to take up, to express, to live. It's a beautiful thing to see people develop in the practice and, and for your life to change. It's, it's really powerful. And it's really such a blessing to be in a, a group of people who all live by these fundamental precepts. Fundamental means, in this case, such a strong foundation for life, for being trustworthy, for feeling safe in a, in a group of people. And then everybody makes mistakes, but then we have a way to recover. Um, we have a way to uh, learn and grow. And uh, what a blessing, what an incredible blessing. And to also see ourselves as part of such a strong tradition reaching all the way back and and in so many places where people understand just by common sense of living regardless of whether they've ever heard the buddha's teachings or not that these five things really support a happy healthy trustworthy life and to be part of that is such a blessing so congratulations always brings up a lot of mudita for me to, to have people um, commit to these, these beautiful precepts and, and the refuges of paying respects to what deserves respect. You know, Buddha means awakening. That potential to awaken is in all of us. The awakened mind and, and what is that? You know, that's realizing that all of this um, material world is impermanent and there's such a tremendous amount of dukkha really coming along with, you know, the, the light and the dark, the good and the bad coming along together in every way in this world. And that there's a way to transcend that, to, to really cultivate and develop our mind, our heart. And that's what paying respects to the Buddha is, you know, that awakened mind, that potential in every one of us and how we cultivate it and choose it and develop it. And then, you know, to really see the truth of the way things are as Dhamma and, and to continue to want to see reality and not live in a way that we're overwhelmed by greed, hatred, or delusion, but that we can see that for what it is and work through our habits and our tendencies towards living according to those um, unwholesome desires, developing our wholesome desires of kindness and caring of truthfulness and wisdom. And then, you know, 
so paying respects to that, having taking refuge in that um, is a kind of safety that we can't find anywhere in the world. And also the Sangha, the enlightened Sangha, those who have really taken the path all the way to its end to complete fruition, to really abide not coming from a, a sense of self anymore, but really just living Dhamma. An, an example of Dhamma in every way, all the time. It's beautiful. And that's, that's the, uh, sometimes I've hear, heard teachers say that's the birthright of a human being. You know, to and, and I love this concept. Many of you have heard me say this before. That's that's uh, held in Thailand in particular, but I think probably anywhere uh, in the in the Buddhist teachings, it's like to really be a human being. You keep these five precepts. It's kind of the baseline of what it means to be a human being, to have real humanity, to not kill other living beings, to not take what isn't really meant for us, um, to not harm anyone sexually, to not be false or deceitful in any way, and to not use substances that cause our mindfulness to dissolve and uh, bring problems into our life and in the lives of others. It's a beautiful thing to commit to that, those precepts. And today, as we've been saying, is a Sala Puja. So we have three holidays in Theravada Buddhism, Buddha Day, Dhamma Day, and Sangha Day. <laughs> we celebrated Vesak together. And, um, you know, a couple of months ago in May, and this is the Dhamma Day. Traditionally, it's held as the day that the Buddha taught the first teaching, the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, the turning of the wheel of the Dhamma, first time expressing really in full um, what he discovered when he was awakened. And we're going to chant it later at, at one o'clock. You know, after the meal, we all are a little little low in energy where we're going to chant the Dhamma Chaka Puatana Sutta together to fire us up. And uh, that will be how we start our one o'clock session. And the devas love it. Um, um, I have good reason to think that um, they gather, frequently gather for that one. They all get named in that sutta at the end. So I think they like that. <laughs> um um, if anyone doesn't know what a deva is, it's it's a heavenly being, angels, um, and um, so so this puja day, this uh, asala puja, celebrating the dhamma and aligning ourselves with it. You know, really, really taking on maybe practices we haven't uh, done before, or maybe increasing something that we have found useful in the past, or sometimes it's uh, <coughs> practicing, picking up a practice of a renunciation and letting go of something that's not been beneficial to us or patterns. We've, you know, some people have shared already some experiences of these emotions that come up and patterns that we have in our conditioning that we want to change and we have the ability to do that which is amazing and thank goodness we do because if we couldn't then we wouldn't be able to awaken but since that is possible we've seen it happen with others and also probably seen seen it unfolding in ourselves in our own practice things that you've changed before and, um, and during this time that starts um, from here for the next three months, which is traditionally called the Vasa, it rains. Um, 
It's the rainy season in India and Southeast Asia. And it was at the time of the Buddha, the time when the monastics, the mendicants would stop traveling, moving around because you've got the monsoons and um, the damaging of crops if you're, you know, walking around uh, out there in the weather. And it's, to think of the thousands, he had thousands of students, the Buddha, these mendicants, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and, and many, many lay followers, thousands of lay followers. And the mendicants would wander and, and uh, you know, be just living on what people would put in their bowls and all of that. But during the rainy season, that was considered a um, difficult, challenging and damaging thing to do so the rule is that we stay put so we still keep that rule so tomorrow evening so we we enter the rains we, we call it entering the rains period um or vasa the day after this this ala puja and so tomorrow evening the mendicant community which is the two of us <laughs> in this case here will be entering the vasa and we, um, we will be entering it and, and staying put at the hermitage uh, that some of you have visited and others haven't seen yet, but it's about an hour's drive from here and it's in the Redwood Forest. And it lasts until the full moon of October, which is October 17th, I believe. It's when this period will end. And for us, it's, I mean, you, when, when, when monastic communities uh, enter this period of time, they might do it in different ways. They might have a period where they really are doing um, uh, silent retreat or something close to it. There's really a lot more meditation practice. Um, perhaps they're, uh, saving that for a different time of year, like a lot of the Western monasteries in the Northern Hemisphere, um, particularly in the West, will have their three months of, of concerted meditation practice in the winter time because it's so much, so, such, so, so calming and quiet. You know, whenever it's rainy or snowy, then it feels, and dark, uh, it feels like a good time to turn inwards. But we've decided that we're going to take this period here in the in this um, end of July, August, September, and early October as our time to have meditation retreat. And um, there's been a lovely uh, organizing going on to um, arrange for people to bring food and take away trash and you know, support this retreat and Lynn, who's online is gonna be living out there with us and a few different people, some of them who are here today are gonna to be coming out to stay for short, shorter periods of time um, to help support uh, taking care of things <clears throat> during this retreat period. But for everyone, all of us, we have a chance to reflect on okay, what, what would I like to put attention on and practice during this period? Would I like to pick up something that I might want to do each day or, you know, a few times a week? Or is there something that I would like to add to my practice? Or is there something that, as I said before, I'd like to um, let go of? practice of refraining from something that hasn't been so helpful or might just might be useful to do that for a period of time. It doesn't have to be the whole three months. Could be, you know, you could do something and set a period of time that you feel like you could actually manage. You know, and it can be letting go of reacting in a certain way. You know, like maybe there's a, a reaction of irritability or like we're mentioning if we have a lot of fear or anxiety, 
It's not like you can say, I'm not going to have fear or anxiety. <laughs> that isn't how it works. It just rises, right? This is part of our kama, our, our conditioning. Um, and it can be as simple as the conditioning of being a human being. There are plenty of things to be afraid of in, the, in human life, just natural dangers. And so feeling whatever we feel, but then the, the, the intention, the commitment can be, I'm going to take time to be present with that feeling, with that experience that arises and observe it rather than be caught up in it. And many of you have heard me talk about this many times. And I also know we hear it from every direction, whether it's psychology or, you know, many other kind of um, perspectives that talk about, you know, you can't overcome trauma, say, by trying to, like, ignore it. you got to, like, work with it get it feel what's there and observe it for what it you know see it for what it is and then let let go of the pattern you know and the way to do that you, you don't um we need to get go through it we can't go around it we can't just skip it <laughs> it doesn't work so that kind of intention brings us face to face with dukkha and that's the first noble truth that's what the buddha teaches in that dhamma chaka pavatana suttis first we have to turn towards the dukkha we have to see it for what it is we we our our job is to understand it and and understanding it means we're not caught up in it we're watching it I, I oftentimes, when I would have very strong feelings and feel very affected by them, and I felt like, okay, when I'm observing them, it's like I'm standing at the edge of this volcano. I'm just watching. I'm, I'm observing it. There can be a, a care that we take for ourselves and at the same time, we're right there observing this tumultuous, perhaps, or biting, or really um, sharp, or irritating, whatever it is, whatever it is, we start to ask questions about it. We start to observe how big this feeling is, where we feel it in the body, what color would it have if it had a color or how do we feel it? Um, I can remember having such strong, like discomfort in my, in my gut. You know, when people say I have a gut feeling, <laughs> you know, or, um, um, you know, you just, you can feel it in the body somehow. And I can remember having such a strong feeling in my, in the pit of my stomach and, and at the same time, the mindfulness is aware, like, oh, there'd be a voice that would say, you know, I think it would be good to get something to eat because let's sort out what's really emotional and what's really physical. And you can, like, tears streaming down and making myself food and I'm eating and, you know, like, it's like, but still staying present with that feeling and observing it. It changes. It moves. And I learned that if it doesn't change, I'm probably clinging to it. You don't want to cling to it. You don't want to brush it off. It's that mindful, with a little bit of distance, experiencing it. And, and letting the understanding come of how this, how this arises. And then the second noble truth says, this is how, um, what, where this, where this, um, what really causes this feeling, what really causes this to come up. And that cause, the Buddha said, our job there is to let it go. And once we see what the cause is, sometimes we see something from our past when we were a child, maybe how this got started, this pattern. 
How did I get so emotional? How did I get so fearful? How did this anxiety, where did this start? And of course, it probably started lifetimes ago. But even if we can identify something that kind of brought it up in this lifetime, sometimes that helps us to let it go, to see and to have the felt sense of being able to kind of feel this all the way through until it's resolved. And when we, when we experience that, being present all the way through a felt experience, there's relief. Third noble truth, the suffering subsides. It ceases. We see this on the individual examples of our practice. And then we start to really lay the foundation to see that in the larger sense, that cessation of dukkha. When we let go of ownership, when we let go of attachments, when we let go and we, we recognize the settling of all sankara, of all formations, and we really experience peace. So when we pick up a practice for this three months or however long you want to do it, and if you, if you choose something that's difficult and you want to only do it for a week or you want to only do it for a day, and you get through that day without having gone down that same familiar path that leads to dukkha, then you can always recommit for the next day. You know, it's like you can just step by step learn how to change our reactions, learn how to change our patterns. And, and when, we, when we do this, we start to really experience bit by bit more peace because that's really what, we're, what our objective is, peace. And we start re- really feeling directly that peace is better than excitement. Peace is better than passion. Peace is better than anger. You might say, well, that's obvious, but it's not. When we're prone to anger, and any of us can be prone to a particular reaction to something, anger is a tip of an iceberg. There's fear underneath. Maybe there's sadness underneath. There's something at the base of anger. The anger comes in to help us feel stronger, more powerful, like we've got control, but we don't. We're out of control when we're angry. And we are not thinking clearly, and we are not responding in a way that's actually going to bring peace and clarity. It's just going to bring more suffering just planting the seeds for more anger, for more violence, for more hatred in the future. So when we, when we start to value peace and we move in that direction, we feel relief. And so, you know, it, it, it sounds like a huge task but it's actually something we can do bit by bit and we can feel the good results. And it comes from really following the whole Noble Eightfold Path, developing our right view, developing right intention. And many of you have heard me talk about the the way of expressing that in English that I like the most, which is, kindness, gentleness, and letting go, that that's our intention in all things. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right samadhi. And one thing we can do is we stand here at the beginning of a period of, you know, like increasing our practice or putting attention on something in particular, 
is we can look at, well, which of those eight feels like it could use some bolstering? Which can, could, where would there be a place in that where I would wanna put some effort? That's one way to kind of look at, well, what do I wanna do during this period? I wanna share a, a sutta or it's actually a, a piece of the Dhammapada to give us some um, place to speak from or put our attention to some ideas. This is from the Dhammapada. I'm just going to read these verses. It's a section called the thousands. Better than a thousand meaningless sayings is a sing single meaningful saying, hearing which brings you peace. Better than a thousand meaningless verses is a single meaningful verse, hearing which brings you peace. Better than reciting a hundred meaningless verses is a single saying of Dhamma, hearing which brings you peace. The supreme conqueror is not he who conquers a million men in battle, but he who conquers a single man himself. It is surely better to conquer oneself than all those other folk. When a person has tamed themselves, always living restrained, no God, no centaur, no Mara, no Brahma can undo the victory of such a one. Rather than a thousandfold sacrifice every month for a hundred years, it's better to honor for a single moment one who has developed themselves. That offering is better than a hundred year sacrifice. Rather than serve the sacred flame in the forest for a hundred years, it's better to honor for a single moment one who has developed themselves. That offering is better than a hundred year sacrifice. Whatever sacrifice or offering in the world a seeker of merit may make for a year, none of it is worth a quarter of bowing to the upright. For one in the habit of bowing, always honoring the elders, four blessings grow, lifespan, beauty, happiness, and strength. Better to live a single day ethical and absorbed in meditation than to live a hundred years unethical and lacking immersion. Better to live a single day wise and absorbed in meditation than to live a hundred years witless and lacking immersion. Better to live a single day energetic and strong than to live a hundred years lazy and lacking energy. Better to live a single day seeing the rise and fall than to live a hundred years blind to rise and fall. Better to live a single day seeing the state free of death than to live a hundred years blind to the state free of death. Better to live a single day seeing the supreme teaching than to live a hundred years blind to the supreme teaching. So I'm just gonna go through this a little bit and give you an idea of what I was thinking in terms of our practice. So this, this idea about meaningless sayings, how many meaningless sayings do we hear in a day? And what do we seek out, you know, entertainment, not to say all of that is wrong. Don't get the wrong idea. As a lay person, don't feel guilty about watching a movie, you know. But notice what's in the movie. Notice whether they're keeping the precepts in the movie. <laughs> notice what kind of dukkha they're bringing on themselves when they don't. <laughs> or, you know, just think about how it affects your mind. And, you know, when, when we talk in these first few verses here, Better than a thousand meaningless sayings is a single meaningful saying that brings you peace. One of the things you could pick up during this time would be some quote out of the Dhamma of the 
you know, or some some saying that really brings you peace of mind and brings you encouragement for living a good life. The same with the verses or reciting something. So a lot of the Buddha very much encouraged people to memorize the teachings. And of course, at that time, they didn't yet write them down. So memorizing was the only way they got passed on. But still memorizing is a really beautiful practice. And sometimes during this three months, oh, and I should tell you that even in monasteries where they're not really doing a full three month retreat time where there's just concerted meditation time, uh, it's a little more like ordinary monastic life when there's a lot of visitors to the monastery and all that mendicants will actually pick up these kinds of practices during this three months maybe extra study of the monastic uh, discipline or doing some kind of practice and so we're we're really in line with the tradition regardless of how much of that practice is actually dedicated to immersion to meditation and there is usually a time for everyone in the monastery, each person in the monastery, to have some, maybe a couple of weeks at least, of um, isolated time where they can really have a deep meditation retreat. But one of the things that you can think about is uh, adding a certain element of study to your practice during this time. You could add memorizing some piece of the suttas or a chant that you want to want to practice that brings you peace, that lifts up the heart. Of course, conquering ourselves is better. This is encouragement for all of these, these practices to really um, to realize that these efforts that we make especially making a determination, an aditana is the Pali word, um, a, a sincere determination to do something for a period of time, that this is a way that we develop ourselves. We tame our mind. You know, when we think about these emotions and, and uh, mental states that can arise, the untamed mind, we just, we just get, you know, pulled around by these these mental states. But when we start to recognize, well, I don't have to follow this. Um, in fact, I can subdue it in a way, work through it, like I described before. And you know, this, this idea that nobody can ever take that development away from you. This is yours. You've created it. You've, you've developed. And, and in fact, what we develop firmly goes with us into the next life. I mean, at some point, you're, you know, there are, there are a few of us who are probably over 70 in this room. <clears throat> By that time, you know it's not going to last forever. And if you're paying attention, you learn that a lot earlier <laughs> and you make use of your time. And so when you pick up a practice like this, that you might, you know, like, okay, I'm going to put some effort in and, and cultivate. That is for your benefit for the long haul. This is really beautiful. And no one can take that away from you. Amazing. And then this idea of sacrifice. So we have so many ideas, uh, you know, human beings have traditions of various kinds and we might have learned things. And we have, and, and, you know, a lot of things that we do, we do because that's what we were taught from early on. Or I have some ideas that I don't know for sure, but I might have tended the sacred flame in the forest in previous lifetimes, <laughs> and it hasn't done me all that much good, <laughs> right? <clears throat> but to really develop the mind, this is, and to, um, you know, as we did earlier, paying respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, to um, using that as our refuge, this is really what's powerful, what's um, purifying. 
in brings a sense of safety. The habit of bowing, um, bringing blessings into our lives. And that can be another practice. I mean, I've known, uh, I haven't done this practice so much myself, except that the tradition I've trained in does a lot of bowing. You know, if you, if you have the influence of Ajahn Chah, then you, you bow when you come in, you bow when you leave, you bow when you sit down, you bow when you get up and you, you know, it's like, and to take that seriously is such a beautiful encouragement to be humble, um, to bring mindfulness to the moment and, um, you know, recognize the, the great beauty of what we have before us. Uh, that's worthy of our respect. And this kind of practice, even something as simple as that, you know, like, let's say you want to pick up a practice where you, you come home, you come to, you know, you have a shrine somewhere in your living space. It doesn't even have to be anything large. It can be in a little corner somewhere, but that's where you sit to meditate and you come in and you bow to your shrine. And when you leave, before you leave, you bow to the shrine. And maybe that's a, that's a practice you want to pick up. I want you to have the sense that there's a wide range of options of what you might want to try to do for these next weeks. And, and just see, you know, what, what effect it has on your mind, what effect it has on, on you. And then, you know, we also <clears throat> noticed earlier that I sometimes fall into giving people the eight precepts rather than <laughs> you can always try, you know, uh, observing the eight precepts like once a week, maybe, or something during this period of time, there's a lot of options for practice potential. Better to live a single day, um, energetic and strong than a hundred years, lazy and lacking energy. So if, if right effort or, uh, bringing up energy is something you want to do during this time. You can think about how would I do that? How would I know that I've done it? So there's another thing I really like about the way the Buddha stated the precepts. Like you really know at the end of the day, whether you intentionally killed a living being or not. And it's about intention too. It's not just an accidental thing. And it's like the mind wants to kill something. Then we know that it is killed on purpose no matter how small it is if we avoid that if we say nope that's my habit from the past but i'm not going to do that i'm going to help this little being get outside where it belongs carefully or something like that and then the mind softens the heart softens and changes and becomes more caring and we see that there is a transformation inside you know, and 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 we've we've decided to resist that. This is so valuable. And and if we want to try eight precepts, you know, like just seeing what is the result? How does that feel? If I avoid eating later in the day, and you know, you might want to sleep on the on a mat on the floor or just sleep in your normal bed, but not indulge in sleep. So different, different um, in, interpretations of that. I think the thing that I really want to encourage is getting to know yourself, getting to know how your own mind works, how your conditioning works, because this is, this is what, how we will know how to guide ourselves in our development. And we're all different. I'm, I'm really uh, intrigued by this idea that even our, the way our brains work is different. Oh, it's 10.30 almost. I'm not gonna go into this story right now. Remind me later today though, I wanna talk about this idea of our, the way our brains work is different. So different practices are gonna be helpful to us. So, um, let's see, anything better here? No, I'm going to stop sharing for the moment. Let's just take a few minutes for any questions. 
got a bit of a late start because we had so much great um, sharing with more people uh, here and online. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, Nita? Um, Aya, if you pick up a practice and if you make a mistake, what should be done? It's a very good question. And if you couldn't hear, it's if we pick up a practice and we make a mistake, what should be done? And of course, monastics know this really well because <laughs> they're picking up stuff, sometimes stuff that's too much. Uh, so you notice that. Well, that, that was a bit um, too ambitious or something like that. But mostly what happens when you make a mistake is you renew your intention. You can go, okay, I, I did that. I learned, learned from what happened, you know, like why. Um, and this is kind of where I'm going with, maybe it was a, maybe the determination we make wasn't quite right. Sometimes people make determinations, especially if you're very idealistic and you're living a monastic life and you think, you know, like I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm only going to sleep three hours a night. I've seen monastics do this. Or I'm not going to lie down to sleep. This is one of the practices, the austere practices. And then they're just falling asleep constantly when they're trying to meditate, right? So maybe what, what we learn is, well, that, that particular practice I picked up was too strong and maybe not, um, not really helpful to me. That's why I make it for a period of time that you can actually push yourself to do it and then reevaluate. But let's say you just, it falls apart in the middle. Then the best thing to do is renew it and make it to the end of the period that you, that you wanted to do it so that you're not just wimping out and letting it, you know, cause if we don't keep, if we don't follow through on what we say, we're going to do it. It is debilitating. So you renew your determination and you do it with a physical action. This can really help plant it in your mind. Uh, like, uh, I mean, Ajahn Sachito was the one who talked about this once. You know, it's, it's like if you, and he had various practices that he would do during the Vasa. Like I'm gonna go out every morning at 4.30 I don't know if this is exactly what he did, but it's, this is what I recall. Like, I'm going to go out every morning at 430 and I'm going to uh, circumambulate the stupa a certain number of times and blah, blah, you know, this kind of stuff. And then there's maybe there's a morning where like it's snowed and there's ice and you don't have boots and you decide not to do it or something like that. Example. So you make the determination again and you stand up as you do it. It's like, you know, really solidifying it in your body, and making your determination to continue with your, with your uh, added time. If it's something more like maybe some moral precept, breaking one of the five precepts, then also you learn from it and you might want to um, talk with a friend about it because that can be really helpful. Someone who's not going to be judgmental and they'll be understanding. And then, and then you, you have a witness for renewing your attention. And so one of the things that we're encouraging is if you, if you feel like it, find a partner during this time to share your practice with. Uh, uh, what did we call on the Mayoro? Did we have a practice? Renunciation buddy, I think is what maybe somebody came up with. <laughs> so if you, you know, if you have a renunciation buddy, that's really nice. It's like the monastics, we do confession with each other every full moon and new moon. And <clears throat> it gives you a chance to talk about even the very minor ways that, you know, that you didn't do what you would really do things in a way you'd really like to. And there's always a, set of circumstances and you can talk about that reflect on that and then renew your your commitment to to your intention 
And if you're doing something for a week or whatever period of time, then you evaluate, okay, how is this? Do I want to do this for another week or whatever that is, whatever that time period is. Any other questions, comments? People seem pretty satisfied. <laughs> okay, so this is intended to be a day of retreat and I don't know how many of you will be able to follow through on that, but to the degree you can, whether it's today or the next couple of days, take some time to reflect on your practice. Hopefully <clears throat> with a lot of congratulations for everything you've been doing, because that's important. Um, this is not just about pushing ourselves. It's about encouraging ourselves, inspiring ourselves. And um, I really like what this one math and physics teacher said to us one day when he said, you know, he really, he's a high school teacher and he said he really um, talks to the students. And he said, you know, someone's not, not applying themselves. And he said, I sit down with them, ask that how it's going, talk with them. He said, you don't start a conversation with, you get back to work. <laughs> I was like, we got to take care of ourselves in that way too. We don't start a conversation by beating ourselves up. Um, in fact, we don't end it like that either. <laughs> you know, it's like really, really encourage ourselves and recall the, the, the good things that have changed and the things that we've been doing and really giving ourselves what we need to be encouraged. So with that, I think we'll um, close this session for Zoom and we'll come back at one o'clock Pacific time and we'll chant the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta and hear a little bit about that. And then through the day, thinking about, and maybe you already know what practice or practices you want to do during this time. And then um, at three o'clock from three to four, we'll talk about those if you want to, whatever you want to share. And, um, and then, you know, if you want to state what you're doing um, with the group, that gives us a little more accountability and a little more encouragement. So just, um, just consider that.